Hi, everyone. August Binias here with CPI Capital. I'm joined by Ava Benasaki. Welcome, Ava. Thank you. Thank you, August. We host CPI Academy, YouTube show dedicated to adding value to our viewers' investment journey. We bring on experts and discuss all topics related to real estate investing. Please subscribe and like the video. We hope you enjoy it. Thank you, August. Great. Hello, everyone. Today, we're excited. We are joined by Greg Dickerson. So welcome, Greg. Welcome, Greg. Hey, thank you for having me here. The Ava in August show. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're right. excited to have you. Greg, if you could please start off by telling our viewers a, bit, a little bit about your background and how you got to the syndicated real estate investments, please. Yeah, so I'm a serial entrepreneur, real estate developer and investor. I started in 1997, my full-time journey after I exited the W-2 field. So I'm a natural born entrepreneur, self-built, self-educated. I started, you know, with nothing, from nothing, went in the Navy right out of high school, did not go to college, learned everything the hard way by doing. I did work some corporate jobs um, for a number of years between 85 and 97 when I got out of the military, well, the military 85 to 89 after that corporate world in restaurants uh, until 1997. And I always had a construction business on the side. And, um, you know, got some really good training in the construction in, or in the real estate or, or um, restaurant industry. Um, also in the military, I did retail. So that's where I got my business training. But in 1997, I started a little remodeling handyman company that I started from scratch with absolutely no money. Um, just had some tools in my pickup truck and I was doing, you know, little odd jobs, anything I could find. Uh, my first project was $500 that I built a little deck on a restaurant. And then I built that in seven years into a $30 million building company sold it. And um, I started 12 other companies along the way. And my whole philosophy was build businesses that generate cash flow to invest in other assets. So I learned how to make money as a young kid by knocking on doors and doing odd jobs. Uh, carried that over into my adult career after I exited the corporate world. I learned how to lead, delegate, motivate, manage people. I learned all about numbers and budgets and forecasts, how to squeeze a nickel out of a penny, you know, all those types of things. And uh, I just so happened to get into the construction industry full time instead of restaurants, which is what I wanted to do. And um, during that seven year period, when I was growing, I was doing a lot of work for other investors and developers and learning as I went along. And I was very fortunate to do uh, a lot of projects with some very sophisticated developers that were, you know, hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. And I kind of learned from them what they were doing in their areas. And this was all from North Carolina up into the DC area of the East Coast. And um, so I built a lot of solid relationships and contacts throughout that region, done a lot of deals throughout that region. So from that seven year period, I did probably, you know, about a hundred million dollars worth of deals using my own cash. After that, I've done another 150. And then with investors and bank capital and equity capital, I've done four or 500 million in other deals along the ways between, that's just in real estate. Then I've done, you know, a few hundred million in equity capital as well with uh, businesses, either starting, growing, selling them or, you know, buying existing businesses, building them up, selling them off. So I love to build things, Bu buildings, companies, people. I'm a builder. That is great. fantastic. Great, great. Awesome. Awesome background. And, and I really enjoy it. And doing some research on you. I know your background is in development, construction and, you know, starting out and scaling your, your, your business. And that is my background as well. So it, it was it was an interesting connection there. And uh, I, I love hearing stories where, you know, one of our expert guests, Kind of it starts out where they uh, they, they literally uh, you know like the uh, the Drake uh, song where it's starting from the bottom now we're here so you literally <laughs> started from 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 that process and build your your brand and your business talk to us about uh, now this is something that happened to me at some point while I was in my construction development career at building single family uh, more on the luxury side for clients for my uh, uh, group of investors and there was a point where a light bulb went on where I realized that my clients, my, where mainly were investors were totally passive, were making more money than I was in, in, in these projects. And, and the idea came, hey, uh, rather than being the general contractor, I want to be a developer. And at some point eventually came to, hey, to be able to scale this business, I need to raise money and be, be able to involve there. So talk to me, if, talk to us if there was such a moment that came in your career where you felt like, hey, I want to be a developer or I want to scale my company or... Uh, you know, view it differently as, as you were just as a, a higher trade or what have you. Yeah, it's funny. Exact same here. I was in the luxury resort home market, you know, working multi-million dollar properties, working with, you know, investors. And I was very fortunate. I, I learned right off the bat 
I was working for a couple of clients. One guy was an executive with Citibank. He was like the number one or number two guy at Citibank. And his other partner was another uh, banking uh, professional. And these guys were, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And they were buying these resort properties and they were doing the value add thing. They were buying them, renovating them, and then, you know, sitting on them for a year or two and then selling them. And these houses were doing anywhere from $100,000 to $200,000 a year in rental income. So they were like little multifamily properties. And, um, you know, they're, I mean, these guys are really fun. They're flying all over the world doing deals. They race Ferraris on the weekends. You know, their balance sheet had, you know, a $2 million wine cellar on it. You know, it was really funny. Um, so I just remember, you know, talking to them and doing stuff. And I said, I want to get in a deal with you guys. I want to do what you're doing. How do I do that? Because I had no clue. You know, back then, this was 1997, 98. And, you know, there wasn't YouTube, there wasn't podcasts, you know, there were there wasn't very much info out there, uh, other than like Robert Kiyosaki and his books, but he hadn't started writing the real estate books or any of that yet. It was just the first book. And um, so I learned a lot by doing projects for these guys. And they showed me, you know, what they were doing, how the numbers worked and, and all of that. So I was very fortunate at a young age to realize and recognize the money was in the money number one. It was, you know, the capital has the loudest voice. Whoever has the money, you know, makes the rules. So number one, it was about structuring finance, raising capital and understanding how finance works. Then number two, um, creating and adding value to property, whether it's a vacant lot, whether it's an existing building, those types of things. And I'd owned houses that I'd lived in, but I'd never invested in real estate at this point in my life when I was doing deals with these guys. And, you know, after that, as I learned and I went along, I mean, my first real estate deal was a lot flip. That's how I started my career, flipped a, flipped a vacant lot. So uh, I was very lucky. And then, and then I sought out other investors like these guys. Several of them were developers doing, you know, just like you and me, they started out, some of them in commercial construction, doing little build outs and strip centers. And then they parlayed into becoming developers and, you know, very wealthy and were very successful. And I was very fortunate uh, to develop a relationship with a couple of brothers that were billionaires, two of the most successful developers in my region. And I learned a lot from them and they were doing residential subdivisions. They were doing commercial, um, you know, so I just kind of learned from these guys working for them as a contractor, uh, even doing trades work. Sometimes I would go in and, you know, do the framing or do the trim or something like that for a lot of these guys. And they just took a liking to me. I'm a hard worker. I asked a lot of good questions. And that's the key. One takeaway for anybody watching this, ask good questions. And what good questions means is when somebody like August says, I started my career in the luxury home development business and I was working for investors, a good question would be, who were these investors you were working for and where did they make their money? You know, those are good questions. And then what kind of business did you do? How did it work? What did the numbers look like? So you want to drill down deep into what, people are doing to really glean the information you're looking for. So always ask good questions, be a seeker of wisdom that will carry you forward. And that's what I always did was I always humbled myself. And I said, look, I don't know anything. I want to know what you know, you're, you're successful. I want to do what you're doing. I want to, I want to get to where you are, teach me. And uh, you know, the, the responses were amazing with the information that people would share with you. Got it. Great. Yeah. So your, your experience in the military, then starting your business, uh, general contracting, building, uh, partnering up with investors, realizing that, hey, the money is in, is in uh, actual development. Now talk to us about when, when you started your first development where you've raised capital and brought on investors and how that looked, any difficulties that you faced at that time, and who were these investors that came on? Basically, that syndication switch that took place, I'm guessing. Yeah, so it wasn't a traditional syndication. The deals that I did, it was more joint ventures and partnerships, and it was just the relationships that I developed. Uh, over the years where one or two or three of us would get into a deal and it was mostly development, bigger deals. And it would be where sometimes all of us would contribute capital, but I would pretty much do everything. I was the guy that always headed everything up. So I found the opportunities. I created the value. I facilitated everything and did everything. A lot of times I would find the, let's say it was a land development deal. I would find the land, um, get it entitled. Then I would create, here's how I did it. So I would find the land, get it entitled. I would create an investment group bring partners in and I would sell the land to the partnership, which I was a partner in for a profit. Then the partnership would turn around and develop the property. So um, that was, that was one of my business models that I used over the years that was very successful. Um, and I still do that model today. And I've used it in uh, you know raw land subdivisions. I've used it in vertical development, all those types of things. And then 
what I did, I was a self-performing general contractor early in my career, but as soon as I could, I sold that company and transitioned into the developer role where the developer hires all of the components, hires the architects, engineers, general contractors to do the work for them. My job was finding the deals, uh, creating the opportunity, bringing the finance to the table, and then bringing the right team, the right professionals to the table to perform all of the tasks. Great. General partner, uh, which takes sweat equity, would you also invest in the deals that you put together and organize? Sometimes, you know, it just depended on what they were. And so I have a very good problem to have for a lot of people, but for me, it's, it's a tough problem is I've got more capital than good deals. So for my investors, they didn't want me putting money in because they wanted to deploy capital. So, um, you know, in that regard, I didn't have to in a lot of deals, but, you know, early on I was putting money into deals and then you know, once I had a good steady deal flow, you know, my investors, they wanted all their capital at, uh, you know, at work. So they wouldn't let me put money in. Great. And I, I was going to say, that's really fantastic. And Greg's been through all this. He's, he's built several companies and, and now you can actually help others. Um, so I know you've coached and mentored entrepreneurs and real estate investors. Um, and I know you've done a fantastic job. I've seen some businesses that you've literally just made blow up, which is fantastic. Um, could you maybe tell us about how you take your clients under your wing and help them with the process of scaling their business? Yeah, yeah, I work with people all over the world. And, you know, one group I'm working with in DC, when when I met them, um, they were probably, they probably had $100 million worth of assets under management. Now they're, they're approaching a billion. I've got another group that I took from four or 500 million to over a billion. A lot of it is, number one, you don't know what you don't know. And all you know is what you know. So number one, it's the awareness of things that you don't know. And, and the keys to success and scale are, are twofold. Number one, um, leadership, delegation, motivation. You got to become a leader, delegator, motivator in order to scale an enterprise. And, you know, that sounds easy, but delegation is an art. Being able to delegate efficiently and to be able to understand as a CEO what your role is and the team that you need to build and how you need to support yourself in that team. So that's one is putting that structure together. The other is understanding the difference between small deals, less than 10 million, and the bigger deals, 50 to 100 million and up. So I get people to transition into the larger deals and understanding how those deals work, where to get the capital, how the financing works for those deals, and more importantly, how to raise the equity for those deals. Because you know a lot of people just don't know how to raise 50 million bucks if they need to raise 50 million bucks. And there's two things that are key to these, um, the ability to be able to do these and be successful at it. Number one, it's what you know, and it's who you know. You know, you need to have the right information and know the right things. And then once you know that, you need to know who to bring that to. So you got to have the right network and you have to have the right knowledge to bring to that network. And once you have those two things, then you get to the point where you have a problem like me, where you have more capital than deals and you have sophisticated capital that understands uh, and has the needs that you need to fulfill. They're looking for opportunities. They're looking for deals to deploy capital in. Once you're proven as an operator and a sponsor and you've grown, um, you know, like I said, they don't want you putting money in because they want to deploy as much capital as they can. They're not worried about skin in the game. You know, that that's a less sophisticated investor concern. The more sophisticated investors, that's not really a concern, you know. And then the other thing is a lot of people have a goal. I want to get to a billion in assets under management. And I had one group specifically that I was working with. And when they told me that, I said, that's great. I said, you know, but that's where you begin. So it's like martial arts, right? You know, a lot of people will go into martial arts to get the black belt. And a lot of people think that's the goal. My goal is to get that black belt. Then once you get there, you realize now I'm ready to begin. And that's what that whole process is about, is to bring you to the point of awareness to where now you're ready for your journey. And that's why there's 10 degrees of black belts, because you're a beginner. You're starting all over again once you get it. Same thing with real estate investing and development and investing in general. You know, certain levels are necessary to get you to the point to where you're ready to begin. And a billion assets under management, really, you know, that's not huge in the whole scheme of investing and developing in real estate. Right on, right on. And you know what, my, there's a saying, there's no I in team. Um, and Greg, maybe you can tell us how you formed your team and were able to manage and scale your company. So what I did was I'd never built a house before I started. All I'd done is little remodeling projects, things like that. Uh, so when I realized I wanted to be a home builder and I wanted to build multi-million dollar homes, I went to the best companies in the area and hired their best people to come work with me. So, you know, you'll hear this, you know, in the world of investment today with what's going on with SPACs and things like that and companies growing and you'll, you'll hear about, you know, a Facebook executive getting recruited here or a Google executive getting recruited there. 
what you do is you go to where success already exists to companies that are like what you want to be and you learn from them and you hire their best people. Um, so that's how you grow and scale a business. You hire people that have been there and done that ahead of you. I never went to college. Uh, my CFO was an MBA. I learned from him. So I hired somebody who had the pedigree, had the credentials, had the education. He taught me. Um, you know, my bankers were all MBAs. Um, a lot of my employees that worked for me were all college grads. I learned from all them. But more importantly, I went to uh, companies that were where I wanted to be. I modeled what they did. I hired their best people and let them build the company for me. I led them and provided them the opportunity to be successful. But more importantly, I turned them loose and let them do it. Great, Amazing. wonderful. Great on, on the projects that you're currently involved with, are do, is the syndic do you uh, utilize a syndicated model or do you still use that um, kind of a joint venture um, structure? Yeah, it's more of a joint venture structure, or it's a um, uh, a fee based opportunity, you know, uh, fee based business model for investors. You know, I may not even be involved; I'm just facilitating it for investors. So, you know, again, I have a lot of capital looking for a home. So I don't need to syndicate, you know, uh, the, the resources that I have are unlimited. So, you know, there's less good deals than there is capital in my world. So I don't really have to do the traditional syndicated route where you bring in 10, 15, 100. I mean, a syndication is just pooling capital to do bigger deals. So in essence, a joint venture is almost like a syndication. You just have less partners in it. Um, oftentimes in the structure of the deal and the agreement are a little bit different. But um, I, I don't know. I think the most investors I've ever had in one deal is probably 10. Yes. Yes. No. For sure. And yes. and and so those those partners within your joint venture are um, are passive. They're not involved on the general partnership side no. or on the day to day operations yeah. and management of the of the project. And these are. Uh, could you t talk to us about? Uh, so so let's say you have a group or audience. now that's in that's in real estate. So that's in real estate. So every real estate deal I've ever done, I've never had an active investor or an active partner. It's, I've always been the lead, and they've come to me for that reason, for my expertise, and they've relied on me for that. And then I allow them to participate with me in the deal because they're putting in the capital. But I'm, I'm, the, I'm. They need me. I'm the reason that, that uh, you know, that they come to me so that you know I can facilitate the transaction. In equity capital in companies, it was different. That's where I had an operator. So when I'm doing a deal with a company, if I'm buying a company, starting a company, building a company, it was never me. I always had an operator, and I coached them, and they ran the day to day. So I wasn't involved in that. Great, great. And let's focus on the real estate part. So today you have you have your network of investors who who come on board joint venture and they're passive. What would be the deal that you currently have for these investors? Is it a development deal? What does it look like? What geographic area is it in? Kind of to walk us through about that perfect deal in your hands today that you would be focused on. So the big opportunity right now is developing developing land to um, deliver finished lots to builders. So I'm working on a couple of projects in uh, the eastern region of North Carolina where we're developing land um, to deliver finished buildable lots to builders. And, you know, this type of deal, it's a, it's a big project, you know, thousand acres plus or minus several thousand lots. And there's a handful of builders that are looking for these uh, these lots to build on. So, you know, stuff like that. Um, I've got a few ground up projects. Um, you know, I tabled, I had some hotel projects I was working on, but I put those on the back burner right now, given you know, the current situation, not a good time to be building a hotel. Um, and then I've got a couple of multifamily projects that I'm working on through the entitlement process, you know, three, 400 unit uh, ground up projects, things like that. So great, great. And, and, and maybe you can also tell us about your view about uh, your, you, you are in the, in the East coast, the, the Carolinas um, area. Is, is that where you're based? Uh, is it in? Yes. Yeah, so I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, just outside of DC. And then I lived on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. So I'm kind of back and forth from that North Carolina to the Virginia Beach, Virginia, Norfolk area up into DC. That's kind of my territory where I focus and do deals, look at opportunities. Great, and, and is the interstate migration that's happening in the US, are, are you noticing the in-migration into your areas currently out of, let's say the New Yorks and the Californias? Oh yeah, yeah. There, there are a lot of people coming out of the Northeast um, down into these areas, but more particularly, a lot of them are heading further south. And then we get what we call halfbacks. So you get a lot of people out of the Northeast United States that will go down to Florida in the Southeast, find out it's too hot, and then they'll move halfway back <laughs> up into the the Carolina Virginia region. So we're in a region where it doesn't get too hot, doesn't get too cold. 
So you kind of get a little bit of that going on. So uh, very popular. And then, of course, Texas has a huge influx. Tennessee's got a huge influx going on. Nashville, Memphis, and then, you know, of course, Arizona, Nevada. Um, you know, th those states are experiencing huge, huge influx of uh, population right now. Great. Great. Awesome. Now, Greg, it was, I was listening to you, I believe it was on Whitney Sewell's podcast, and you were talking about how you love to read books. Maybe you mm -hmm. can read us one of your top books. That oh, you yeah. Read. And then I cracked the joke that he doesn't like music. Uh, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. he only listens. Yeah, to I've never, never like, had a song on I'm any of my devices. I'm like, who's, who, 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 who does that? Who only he has books? To learn. He yeah. loves to so, learn. <laughs> so maybe you could share with us because that would be great. Yeah. I mean, I just can't get enough. I'm always pouring yeah. into myself. So back in the day when it was the, um, you know, uh, Sony Walkman cassettes, I had books on tape and that's all I listened to. I put them in my car. I put them in my, you know, in my headphones. And then it was the CD Walkman. And then it was the, you know, 80 gig iPod. If you remember the first iPod, I still have that old thing full of all kinds of books and stuff. And, you know, then now, you know, it's just podcasts and, and YouTube. And I mean, I'll listen to some music here and there, but I don't own any, don't have any on any of my devices. I own books, audio books, that kind of thing. So um, I started out years ago, like I said, Rich Dad, Poor Dad was the big one that triggered in me. I didn't get real estate out of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. What I got was build, I wanted to be Rich Dad, not Robert Kiyosaki. So I went out on a tear to buy companies, build companies that generated cash flow to invest in other assets that would pay for my lifestyle and everything else. So that was the big mindset shift for me. I was, you know, um, an employee from that point before I started my full-time business. I always had a side business while I was working full-time in my other jobs, you know, a little side construction business. But it wasn't until I read that book that it clicked. Wait a minute. If I want to create a lifestyle, I need to go ac acquire assets that generate income to pay for whatever I want to do or whatever it is I want in my life. And more importantly than that, I need to build a business that's going to generate that because I'm limited anywhere else. So the only way I'm going to be able to create what I want is I've got to go create it through a business and or businesses and then go from there. So Rich Dad, Poor Dad was the first one. Uh, Power of Positive Thinking, Norman Vincent Peale, Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Dale Carnegie. Um, you know, those were the foundations of my business training. Um, you know, uh, one of the best books on business and, and wisdom is Proverbs, regardless of your faith. That book is full of unbelievable business and life advice. You know, so that that's always been one of my favorite books. Um, it's in the Bible. And, uh, you know, then there's so many more after that. But those were the core books that really transform my mindset to anything is possible. I can do anything, you know, within my limits. I'm not going to go be an NFL quarterback, right? But from a business standpoint, if I educate myself and apply what I'm learning, and that's the key, apply what I'm learning, um, and then learn from my mistakes and grow and seek wisdom from others, find others who are where I want to be and learn from them, then nothing is impossible for you. Incredible. Yeah. Great. 100. Yeah. Um, I just actually finished uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. That's a really good one. <laughs> yeah, that book never gets old. Never gets old. Um, maybe you can just quickly tell us on a, on a current project that you're working on, yeah, either yeah. personal For sure, development yeah. or business. Yeah. It's, 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 so, so obviously in, in your journey and you're, you're, you have such hunger to, for, for, you know, educating yourself and self-improvement. Uh, is there any personal projects that you're working on, on the self-improvement side and also on the development side? I believe you mentioned a few a there, few but, them, yes. uh, if you can touch Yeah. Them. Yeah. Mostly, you know, my focus right now is land with the real estate housing market. Like it is that's, that's where there's huge opportunity right now. Um, but as far as a pet project for a business, a company that I'm looking to scale, that's going to impact the world is my school of entrepreneurship. So I'm creating courses and I have courses, online courses that are based on everything I know. And I've learned over my career in the last, you know, 25 years as an entrepreneur, real estate investor and developer. So that school of entrepreneurship is evolving. And the idea is, you know, to build these curriculum that can be used anywhere in the world for different things. I have different real estate investing courses. I have different courses on how to buy a business, how to start a business, how to do an online business. So I'm going to continue to grow and develop that school of entre entrepreneurship. And, you know, my goal is to get that into the hands of people all over the world, because I believe and I know the way to make a difference in the world and impact, which is what I'm after at this point in my life. I've, I've done pretty much what I want to do from a business standpoint. I'm after impact now. And the way to impact your world, your community, your life, in the best possible way, from my experience, is through entrepreneurship, especially today. There is no other path like, like entrepreneurship, and it's different than it was when I was coming up. 
Uh, it's so much easier now to, to, to become an entrepreneur, whether it's real estate entrepreneurship or, you know, um, just general business entrepreneurship. There's just so much that it frees you up to do. But the biggest thing is it frees you up to make an impact on, on your world, your community around you. Uh, so that's, that's what I'm really excited about, really focused on, and that I'm pour, pouring a lot of time, energy, and attention into right now. Great. Amazing, Greg. That is so, that's fantastic. You're doing a lot of great things. Um, what's the best way people can reach you? Yeah, so my website, gregdickerson.com. So I have a YouTube channel, podcast, all kinds of info on there as well. Um, uh, so it's gregdickerson.com. Awesome. Okay. And we'll, we'll, we'll include that in our, in our YouTube of um, details uh, for sure. If you'd like to maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of conclude here. With our, with our question we ask every single yes. guest, this is going to be great for, uh, from, from Greg, but what is your number one advice to a passive investor or someone looking to start passively investing in real estate? So getting their money working for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To, you know, to get started and to do it and to educate yourself on, you know, the investment vehicle that you want to invest in, whether it's real estate, whether it's stocks, Bitcoin, NFTs, whatever it is you want to do, you know, cryptocurrencies, understand the space, understand where your money's going, but just get out there and get started and do it. Start with a little bit and then, you know, grow and scale it from there. But, you know, you have to invest if you want to grow wealth, if you want your assets to grow, you've got to invest, you got to get in the game. Great advice. Great advice, Greg. Well, thank you so much, Greg. We really appreciate your time. We do. Thank and um, this concludes our YouTube show today. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, it was. Yeah, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it.